The text for today is James, chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 19 through 27. Okay, while you're getting there, I'll give you the situation. Here's the situation. You've had to bail out of a plane. Curious, has anyone ever jumped out of an airplane? No one. Well, there you go. Not yet. Okay. You've had to bail out of a plane. Now you're on a mountain covered with forest. You're lost. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You need shelter. You need to treat a leg wound so it doesn't get infected and kill you. But, as luck would have it, you happen to have with you a copy of the U.S. Air Force Survival Handbook, which is generally acknowledged to be the most comprehensive guide available for surviving in the wilderness. It tells you how to forage, how to find food and water, build shelter, signal for help, find direction without a map, how to apply basic first aid, and how to conceal yourself from danger. So, you sit on a large rock, and you read the U.S. Air Force Survival Handbook. So now you know how to do all those things. You feel so much better. You're reassured. You're relieved. You fully trust the material. You have not the slightest doubt that it's all quite true. It's been tested in the wild for many years, and it's always been found to be accurate and life-saving. So you close the book, and you wonder, why am I still hungry? Why am I still thirsty? Why does my leg still hurt? I know how to address each of those problems. Well, at that point, a talking crow, just go with it, flies down, sits on your shoulder, and tells you you have to actually do what the book says for it to have any positive effect in your life. You can read it. You can recognize its truth. You can agree with it, but none of that does you a bit of good unless you get off the rock and you get to work. Now, I've met a fair number of Christians who say they don't read the Bible enough. I get it. I don't read the Bible enough. But I've never met a Christian, I have never met a Christian, who said their problem was they read the Bible too often. They spent way too much time in Scripture and prayer every day. They really wish they could cut down their Bible study to get in more Netflix. That doesn't seem to be too much of a problem among the Christians I know. What I would be willing to bet is a much more serious problem among us Christians is not that we don't read the Bible often enough, but that we don't put what we read into practice often enough. I know that's true for me. I suspect it might be true for one or two others here this morning. And that's exactly the problem our passage for today, James 1, 19-27, addresses putting God's word into practice. So let's read the passage. Starting at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of men does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore... Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and, doesn't, and, sorry, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let us pray. Thank you so much for your word, Father. Um, I pray that as 
I preach, what I might do is illuminate your word, bring your word into sharper focus in these people's minds, so that when we all leave, we all understand your word much better. Amen. Now, the beauty of this passage, really, is that it not only tells us what to do to be doers of the word and not hearers only, verse 22, it gives us a lot of help in putting that into practice. Specifically, I see three things in this passage that help us obey the word and become doers, not just hearers. One, we obey because of God's righteousness. Two, we obey to stop deceiving ourselves. And three, we obey because of blessings. Now, I'm assuming this morning that I'm preaching to people who, like me, want to be the kind of Christian that's held up in this passage. We want to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We know that's the right way to be. We want to put away all filthiness and wickedness. We want to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. We don't want to deceive ourselves. I mean, if there's anything worse than being deceived, it's deceiving yourself. We want to bridle our tongues. We want to keep ourselves unstained from the world. And this morning, what I want to show us, what I want us all to see, is how this passage helps us in doing all that. Now, I would bet that if James were a football coach around today, he would be a pretty good one. Because good coaching is not telling athletes what to do. Good coaching is showing them how to do it. Okay, imagine this as a football coach. All right, Johnny, uh, you need to throw the football in such a way that your receiver catches it on its outside shoulder without breaking stride, keep in line with the post, in such a way that the defensive back coming in from the strongest of safety doesn't have a play on the ball. Thanks. I knew that. Show me how to do that. <laughs> James tells us what we need to do. We need to not only read God's word, we need to obey God's word. And like a good pastor, like a good coach, James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, first helps us understand why obeying God's word is important, and that is important to know the why. You're much more likely to do something if you understand why you're doing it. And then James helps us to actually obey what we see in God's word, to put it into practice, to become doers and not just hearers. So, <clears throat> pardon me, to summarize then, I want us to understand how this passage gives us help in obeying God's word from three areas, God's righteousness, avoiding self-deception, and blessings. Point one, we obey because of God's righteousness. Let me read those uh, first three verses again. This passage breaks them nice into three chunks, so that's how we'll look at it this morning. So I'm going to read verses 19 through 21. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Okay, the first point is we obey the word, we do the word because of God's righteousness. Well, let's go, let's go <coughs> through these three verses, see what they make sure we understand what they actually say before we see what they mean for us today. Verse 19, where it says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Well, that was a well-known wisdom saying in ancient Jewish culture. That's something that your rabbi would say to you, okay? And it's actually, you can find it in a number of places, that idea in the Old Testament. Uh, Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. There are many other Proverbs that restate that same basic idea in other ways. Uh, the book of Sirach, don't bother looking in your Bible for it, it's in the Apocrypha. Not that I make a habit of quoting from the Apocrypha. It's not scripture, but it is an interesting collection of Jewish writings and one of the traditional... <laughs> sayings in Sirach is, be quick to hear and be deliberate in answering. If you have understanding, answer your neighbor. But if not, put your hand on your mouth. That's pretty good advice. Glory and dishonor come from speaking, and a man's tongue is his downfall. 
Now, as we go through James, we will see that he is very concerned about the power of the tongue as well. That's something we're going to run into a lot. The point being, yes, this is good advice, but is it uniquely Christian advice? Any good Muslim would agree you should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. A moral atheist would agree with that. Hindus and Buddhists certainly would agree to that. So why is it in the Bible? What's unique about the Christian understanding of this rather uncontroversial advice? Why is this worth preaching on? Is James saying be quick to listen to the word of God? No, not really. I mean, yes, you should be quick to listen to the word of God. But if you take that reading, as some do, you have difficulty explaining the rest of that sentence. What, be slow to be angered by the word of God? Doesn't really make sense. Now, what James means under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is found in verse 20, where he gives a reason for repeating this well-known saying. For Christians, we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger in all worldly situations because the anger of humans, our anger, does not produce the righteousness of God. As humans, we are often pro provoked to anger by things that would provoke anybody to anger. We're tempted to lash out in anger, you know, fire back a really sharp, cutting remark, or otherwise respond because our human pride's been hurt. Evidently, this was an issue for Jewish people of the time. Most of James' hearers, of course, would have been raised in and would have been so living in Jewish culture. Now, the Jews, as some of our ancient history friends would know, revolted against the Romans in the year 66 AD. James is writing this letter most likely between the years 45 and 60 AD. Not that long before all the simmering tension between the Jews and the Romans exploded into open revolt. In other words, our Jews were getting tired of the Romans, who were taxing them heavily. They were getting tired of seeing Roman aristocrats in the area living on the wealth of the backs of Jewish taxation. Striking out against the Romans in anger would have been generally considered by Jews to be an act of godly righteousness. But in this letter, as we'll see, James will associate righteousness with peace, that's chapter 3, and patience, chapter 5. Striking out in anger is not acting in line with God's righteousness. It's our human pride saying, I know how things ought to be. Now, whether that's putting someone in their place with a sharp remark, whether it's showing that someone else can't get the better of us, or simply demonstrating our rightness and someone else's wrongness, human anger, which practically always comes from human pride, not a genuine concern for godliness, is not God's way of handling the situation. Now, not to say anger is always wrong. If you've heard that, you've been misinformed. <laughs> Jesus gets so angry at the money changers and the people running Saturday morning markets in the temple that he makes a whip and kicks them out. He's smashing tables. But Jesus isn't losing his temper. Jesus isn't acting out of wounded pride. Okay. Our anger is almost always us losing our temper because some aspect of our pride has been hurt. That guy cut me off. She cheated me out of money she owes me. They can't speak to me like that. I know my kid's doing that just to irritate me. The government has no right to do that. It's unfair. Jesus never loses his temper. God never loses his temper, although God gets angry all over the Old Testament. God is angry many times at Israel's disobedience. Dozens of, dozens of times in the Old Testament, it says of God, his nose became hot. Has your nose become hot recently? Mine has. It's an, it's an expression that means his anger was kindled. I could give you 30 references. Uh, therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he struck out his hand and struck them. That's from Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, in Numbers and Joshua, Judges, Isaiah, Hosea, they all say God is angry at Israel's disobedience. Job 4.9 describes God's righteous anger against sinners. At the breath of God, they are destroyed. At the blast of his anger, they perish. 
Read the Psalms. God, God, God gets angry a lot. Okay, now, we're not Jesus, okay? We're not God. The Holy Spirit is telling us to be slow to anger because if we stop and think about it, we'll almost always realize our anger is not godly anger. It's human anger, destructive human anger, which does not please God, which reinforces the parts of us that God's trying to get rid of. Our pride is probably the biggest problem we have in keeping us from becoming as Christ-like as we want to be. And every time we indulge human anger, we're reinforcing that pride and making it harder for God to take away. Okay, great. That's good advice, Dave. Thanks. How do I do that? <laughs> I thought you said James helps us with how to do this, not just telling us don't be angry. I'm glad you asked. Verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Okay? Put away all filthiness. Sounds like a good thing to do. Put away wickedness. Sounds good. That's what all Christians should be doing. But like with don't be angry, how do we do that? I mean, it's hard to do. Yes, it is which is why you need to receive with meekness, with humility, the implanted word. The implanted word? What's that? Now, the book of James was written very early. Most scholars think it was probably the first New Testament letter written. So James isn't talking about Paul's letters, Peter, John's letters, what we think of as God's word, when he told his people to receive the implanted word. In other words, he, James wasn't saying, go read the New Testament. That's what we would think of if someone says, go, you know, look at the word of God. No, what James meant by the word of truth, by which God gives us new birth, the gospel. God has put that within us. All Christians have it. Now, it's not like, don't let the English word confuse you. It's not like a seed planted that then grows. That's another image. But it means you have the new birth, your new creation in Christ, because God has put the gospel complete and full by the power of the Holy Spirit in you as a Christian believer. We are to receive it. Now, receive means accept it as the norm for your life. That's what that Greek word to receive means. It's a lot more powerful than the English word. We think of receive as thank you for the delivery. What receive here means is to live by it, to do it. So today we have the word James is talking about here. It's in, I mean, it's, it, it is in the whole Bible, of course, that's been written since James was writing. All of it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, who is the word of God implanted in us. You didn't, that means you didn't implant it in yourselves. God did it, and that's the power to live and obey this word. James is saying the way you control your anger, the way you get rid of filthiness and evil from your life, is by receiving, living by what was put in you at salvation, and you can do that because God gives you the power to do that. You can put it into action because you have the power. The truth that you are now in Christ, Christ in you, is all the power you need to overcome your anger, filthiness, and evil. It's not passive. You do need to put forth effort, welcome to the Christian life, but the dazzling brilliant, earth-shattering difference between us controlling our anger and someone out there trying to better themselves as a person by, you know, controlling their anger through meditation or, I don't know, whatever, Tai Chi, crystals, whatever they do, is that we have the power to do it and they're just behavior modifying. That's behavior modification. We have the power of God in us to mold us into the people he wants us to be and that's why we know we can do it. It's not just a mental thing. There really is a God you're praying to. You do really have the power in you to follow God's will. You have it. Sure, for a non-Christian, there are, you know, YouTube videos you can take how to control your anger, how to get rid of your bad habits. It's all willpower. It's all white-knuckling it through. I, I mean, some do very well. But it's all just behavior adjustment. It's not being transformed into a new person. When you use the power of the Holy Spirit to control your anger, get rid of evil, get rid of filthiness, God is making 
you into the image of Christ through his power. It's real. It's happening. Receive it. Use it. Sometimes I wish I were a black preacher. I could really get into that, but I'm sorry. So that's point one. Don't just read the word. Do the word. Obey the word. Because that's how you're conformed to the image of Christ, and you have the power to do it. You have no excuse. <laughs> now, 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 that's really the major point of this whole passage for today. If you get that, the rest follows. We're not going to spend quite as much time on the others as we did on that one. If you get that God can tell you to do his word, and not just hear it, but do it, and he can expect you to obey that, because he's given you the power to do that, then if you really truly get that, you're 80% of the way there. Okay. Point two is we obey to stop deceiving ourselves. This is verses 22 to 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, one great worry we all have as Christians is or it should be a worry. If it's not, then I'm worried that you're not worried about it. Am I deceiving myself? Am I being led astray in any area? Being watchful for others trying to deceive us is good. It's rightfully a major concern. But what's worse is if you realize you're deceiving yourself. Now, it's James's concern, too, since he mentions it twice, three times, if you count verse 16, saying, don't be deceived. And here's how you can tell. If you're hearing his word, understanding it, you know what it says, but you're not doing it, then yes, as verse 26 says, if you think you're a Christian, you're deceiving yourself. Not that if you sin, you're not really a Christian. All Christians sin every day. The difference is if the word is guiding you past and through your sins. The stumbles, the pitfalls we all face. Again, let me emphasize, James is not saying, the Bible is never saying, that obeying the word is how you earn salvation. He's saying, if you are saved, this is how you will want to live, according to the word of God. And the deceiving yourself, in verse 22, what it really means is that you're defrauding yourself. You're cheating yourself. In other words, what verse 22 is saying is, if you hear the word, but don't do it, you're only cheating yourself. You think it's enough to agree with what the Bible says? Great, demons do that. Demons agree with what the Bible says. Then demons know it's true. Demons have very good theology <laughs> in terms of knowing the truth about who Jesus was, what he said, and what his commands for Christians are. But it just doesn't do them any good because they don't live by it. They don't do it. It's not enough for us that we agree with the word when we read it. It's not enough that we agree, yes, that's what we should be doing. We need to actually do it. If we don't, we're cheating ourselves out of the growth and the joy, which is our right. Now, here in verses 23, 24, James gives kind of a weird illustration of saying that someone who hears the word but doesn't do it it's like a person who looks in the mirror then turns away. Well, what's the connection there? What, is, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in first century Roman culture, especially in this part of the world, mirrors were rare. And what mirrors there were were polished metal. Okay. What you think of today is a mirror, glass with a silver backing. That was invented by some German guy in the 1830s. Okay. So a person back then did not often see themselves in a mirror, but when you did, you didn't really get a clear image. You know, so on the occasional instances when you did see a mirror, it was easy to see a reflection, such as it is, and, but pretty soon you would kind of forget what you looked like. 
because it might be a long time before you ever saw it again. Now, in contrast, verse 25, James says, what we need to do is stare into the word, into God's perfect law, meaning his word, and in the doing of it, you're freed. Because verse 25 says, if you persevere in what you see in the word, in the law, don't just hear, forget, yes, that's very nice, you know, Monday morning, you've totally forgotten the sermon, but doing, acting on what you see there, then you'll be blessed. And if you don't, you're cheating yourself. I really can't make it any more plain than that. Let's say you take out a gym membership. Three months. You can go at 24-7. You can use all the machines, all the weights. There's a trainer there to help you with your what personal fitness goals, whatever those are. Great, you're all set. But you never go. You've paid all that money for the membership. There's plenty at the gym for you to do. All of it would be very beneficial for you, but you walk away and you forget about it. Well, congratulations, you've just cheated yourself. You've defrauded yourself of the money you spent on the membership. You thought joining a gym would help you get in shape. You joined a gym. You paid your dues. You have full access to the gym, but you never got in shape because you, you cheated yourself. You never went. That's what James is saying, don't do here. In the word, in the perfect law, is everything you need to grow into the person you want to be, the person God created you to be. The word is implanted in you. Feed it, nurture it, follow it, do it, and yes, your life will see blessing after blessing. Choose not to do what you see in the word, and you're going to cheat yourself. Point three, obey because of blessings. We like blessings. First, we obey because of God's righteousness. Second, we obey because we don't want to deceive ourselves. We don't want to cheat and defraud ourselves. Third, we obey because we want the blessings that only come from obeying the word. Let me read verse 25 again. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Frankly, this is almost self-explanatory. You, really you really don't need me to explain this part to you. Um, if you have a survival guide in the wilderness, and you're in the wilderness, and you read it, but you don't do what it says, you know you're not going to live very long. If you think just reading will keep you alive, you're deceiving yourself. And I don't need to explain to you that if you have a gym membership, but you never go to the gym, you're not going to get in shape. So we should all be on board with the concept that God wants to bless us. He's told us that. And he's told us how he wants to bless us by transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, the word implanted in us. So we shouldn't be surprised to hear that if we don't obey the word, we're not going to get the blessings. We're not going to get the benefits. We're going to cheat ourselves out of every single one of them. And then we complain, we find the Christian life to be very hard, very dry, and very dull. Well, of course we do. <laughs> what do you expect? Let's say you go to New York City. Go to your hotel room, pull out a book about all the wonderful, fantastic things to go do, see in New York. Day after day, you read about museums, art galleries, restaurants, concerts, festivals. It all sounds so wonderful as you sit there in your hotel hotel room, never going out, never actually doing any of the wonderful things the guidebooks show you. After about a week, you fly back home. Your friend asks you, so how is New York? You say, oh, it's kind of boring. Boring, they ask. Yeah, I didn't do hardly anything at all. Things are much more exciting here in Wellsford. Wait, you spent all that money? <laughs> you went all that way? And you just read about all the great things to do in New York? You didn't do any of them? You cheated yourself. You didn't get any of the blessings of being in New York City because you didn't do what you read about. Now, we read the Bible. We hear the Word. The Holy Spirit is in us, witnessing to the truth of God's Word. If we're not doing it, we're cheating ourselves. Out of all the blessings God wants to give us, the ones He told us about. No wonder we find our Christian lives hard, dull, and boring. What do we expect? Friends, don't let this happen. 
In this passage for today, we get help in obeying God's word by explaining God's righteousness, avoiding self-deception, and receiving blessings. Living a blessed, interesting, fulfilling Christian life is no big secret. It's all in the Word, as the Holy Spirit quickens that to our hearts and minds and gives us the power to do it. Our part is simply to obey. Now, the last part, verses 26 and 27, are given as examples of what James has been talking about. Let me read those now. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. An old friend of mine from high school, um, Vicki, had a very interesting life, a lot of ups and downs. Today, she's living in Kazakhstan, running an orphanage. <laughs> Never thought she'd be doing that. Um, but she named her orphanage the J127 Ranch. James 127 Ranch. Yeah. Now again, in verse 26, James is saying, if you think you're doing well with God, but if you have an uncontrolled tongue, spouting off in anger, evil, and filthiness, you are deceiving yourself. No matter how much Bible reading you're doing, no matter what kind of religious rituals and duties you're performing, if you're not letting the word implanted in you guide you, your religion is worthless. It's doing you no good. Verse 27 isn't a legalistic declaration. You know, orphans, widows, him, no, her, no, just orphans and widows. It's an example of the kinds of works you'll do when your heart's in line with God and your character and conduct line up with each other as you're following the Holy Spirit. Uh, Craig Keener, who's written a very good commentary on James, tells us that for the people James is writing to, quote, orphans and widows had neither direct means of support nor automatic defenders in that society. When we uh, went through the book of Ruth a little while ago, we saw this. If you were a widow, you were in really bad shape. And if you were an orphan, you were in really, really bad shape in that culture. Keener goes on to say that in Judaism, charity distributors made sure that widows and orphans were cared for if they had no relatives to help them. Such charity is part of what James is talking about here. Greek society did look out for freeborn orphans, but not other ones. Jewish people visited the bereaved, especially during the first week of their bereavement, but also afterward, and they visited the sick. Many Greco-Roman writers valued visiting the sick and bereaved. So these are examples, okay? They're not legalistic declarations. These are examples of the kinds of things people do as part of the emphasis of the Jewish law which places assistance for the poor at the heart of what it means to be actually religious. Now, as we go from here into chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we'll see that this isn't the only thing James has to say about rich and poor. James has a lot to say about rich and poor and how they should be treated by the church. But that's next week's sermon. In conclusion for today, in this passage for today, James, as a good pastor, is concerned for his church. He knows they've been reborn by the word of truth, the gospel implanted in them. He hates seeing them lashing out in anger, born of human pride, instead of pursuing the righteousness of God. He hates seeing them deceiving themselves, cheating themselves out of all the blessings of obedience to their loving Heavenly Father. May we be equally anxious to enjoy all the fullness, all the blessings of obedience that God wants for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for implanting the word in us. We thank you that we know we have the Holy Spirit, all the power of God, to live blessed lives of obedience to the word. Help us, we pray, to remember that daily, to not react according to human pride, but according to your word, which results in your righteousness and your blessings because we don't want to cheat ourselves out of any blessings you want to give us, Father. In your name we pray everything. Amen.